time for a journal club review. I know that's what you're thinking it was time for. I got a great article for you today. I know I say that about all of them, but um, if you are uh, interested in training theory or a strength coach, um, personal trainer, sport coach, whatever it may be uh, in the field of exercise, sports science, especially related to sports, performance, strength, conditioning, that type of thing. Um, a, what I would call it's a, it, so if you're not familiar with the research, right, a review is just that it's a review of all the re- available research and it's the opinions of the authors organizing this research in such a way that um, they present the data. And so what I have here, and I'll talk about a second, which it's basically a, a manual. So what I'm getting at, it's a brief review, but it's a manual. And so there's lots of books on periodization out there. It's what this is going to be about an organization of training. Okay. Programming and periodization. And I think the authors here point out in this, um, this review that <clears throat> periodization and programming are not the same thing. Periodization is the construct you work within to program. That's good. You know, cause there's a lot of critics. There, no, there's, I've heard crit- critiques of periodization that don't really make a lot of sense to me, to be honest with you. But other than, um, outside of the context of, you know, or in the context of somebody's untrained, but anyway, let's just get the article. So it's called periodization and block periodization sports emphasis on strength, power training, a provocative and challenging narrative. Um, some very famous authors in the field of, um, training theory research and strength conditioning research. The first author is Michael stone. If you're not familiar with that name, uh, I encourage you to become familiar with it. Dr. Stone's been around a very long time. Um, Dr. Hornsby, Dr. Half Fry, um, Dr. Pierce. Okay. Um, these are all in some way. Dr. Pierce is a famous weightlifting coach. Kendrick Ferris is a weightlifting coach and a professor for many years, a uh, long time. Dr. Fry's done some amazing, I won't go to every one of them. They're all, um, accomplished researchers. Um, and so this, this page, the page numbers from this are 2351. This is a, again, the journal strength conditioning research, just to give you an idea how big this thing is 2351 to 2371, uh, which that's the reference page. That's a fairly large, um, article and and maybe it's like maybe a little less than that just because of the reference page um it's um that's why i say it's a manual so if you're looking if you don't like ah i don't want to buy i don't understand periodization i don't get it or i want a a good book on programming don't buy a book just download this article okay and i'll put i'll put the the link to it um if you're a member of journal of strength journal if you're a member of the um, national strength conditioning association you'll get this for free i don't know if it's a public domain download or not um, but it's worth a look, okay? If you can get access to it in some way and you're interested about periodization or if you have questions about it, um, it's a very well done, well written article. Again, I would call it more of a manual than um, than anything else. So um, what is this article about? Well, if you've watched my uh, video on training theory, that's what undergirds a lot of what we're talking about here. Uh, the article goes over this, the idea of periodization. If you're not familiar, it's just an organization of training. There's different ways to um, format periodization. Um, the traditional way is high volume, low intensity. Over time, you change to high intensity, low volume. That, in a very simplistic sense, that's what periodization is over the long term, what we call a macro cycle. Mesocycles are typically week long. Micro cycles are week, weeks training and sometimes even a daily daily training. Um, it, you know, there's different definitions from different people. Uh, but th- this article talks about how to organize the blocks. I already, I did a video on blocks, different types of mesocycle organizations. Um, this article does a really nice job of expanding on that and how to place the block sequentially, right. In order to improve sports performance. In this case, uh, the article talks about sprinting rate of force development type of work. So explosive movements, jumping, sprinting, your typical field court sport athlete type of activities. Um, this can be applied, this information can be applied to, and they, they talk about, um, do a good job of some of the challenges of periodization. Like, well, what if I'm, uh, if I'm training multiple, um, constructs? So in other words, I want to get stronger and faster or bigger and stronger. Those are unique challenges. You know, uh, how do I do that? Well, this article talks about that. Um, the unique challenges, um, in timing, that's always been a knock on the periodization model is, well, you're only going to peak once, right? You're only going to peak once. Uh, in the periodized model. And that may be fine for like a one big track meet, but what about if, and you know, they call it the, you know, kind of the market schedule in this article uh, that is, you know, some of these track athletes and, and um, what I'll call Olympic sport athletes, but we could apply that to anything, football, basketball, right? Typical schedules. You have to be peaked every game, right? Or at least hopefully somewhat peaked every game 
um, in order to be successful. You can't just peak for one game or one event in many sports. It's just not possible. So this article does a good job of addressing some of those challenges and pulling down this, this is conceptually, um, I think really important. So there's uh, the article explores the idea of block periodization or talks about the idea of block periodization. Um, and block periodization is just a fancy way uh, from all the years I've read this, but Dr. Cern's books, which are fantastic called block periodization. Um, it's just a, a redefinition of linear periodization where linear periodization is over a long period of time. Blocks can be smaller training blocks. Okay. Let me give you an example. Let's say you do three weeks of higher, per, uh, high, higher, if you do three weeks of hypertrophy training, so you're gaining size, you're, it's all volume based type of work. You're building out conditioning. Um, you know, you're building up the volume and weight training, and then you have some sort of deload, reload adjustment, re rejuvenation week. Um, and I'll give these names, names a little bit. And then you transition into a lower volume, high intensity type of phase. So um, your, your lifting volume comes down and let's say the outcome that's desired is in this case, again, depends on the outcome. The outcome is desired as a field coach sport athlete. You want to get them faster and stronger. You'll bring up the agility and sprint volume over time of the next cycle, the next four weeks. Um, if you think about what's happening fatigue wise, remember volume builds, volume kills. And so I'm pulling the volume down significantly, uh, not significantly, substantially, let's put it that way, compared to with the peak that I hit in the previous cycle with resistance training, I'm pulling that volume down. So sub fatigue is subsiding. Uh, my conditioning is coming down. So total volume for the training for that next cycle is down while intensity is increasing. I'm running as fast as I can. I'm jumping as high as I can. I'm lifting heavier weights. And then the last phase might be three weeks. Um, I don't know how my math is bad. The transition, okay, and then three more weeks of a peaking phase. Um, sometimes it's called special prep. These, all these, these, this, this sequence has, um, has been given so many different names. I think that's why it gets very confusing. So what I just talked about could be called general preparatory when we're doing the high volume stuff. Now we're going special prep, even midway through that second cycle when intensities are higher. And so now we're into special prep. And so the volume could bump up. And I, I, I like how this article points out a very important, I've seen this in the research literature as well. And with athletes I work with, when you start on that last cycle, what's very common is to keep dropping the volume is to have remember volume build. So have that one, another push on volume, but this time with heavier loads. So um, let's say 85%, you know, you're in the 85% range on squatting, right? Where in the beginning you were working with 70, 75, and you were in high volumes. Now you can do 85 with a high volume. Now you're not going to the same volume that you did with 70, 75, but you would do the volume such with the 85% that would be pushing it. In other words, if we use um, the old table, right? Um, Prilipin, prelipin, however you want to say his name's table is, um, you know, that optimal range for 80% is roughly 15 reps. Well, you might push the limits there and push it up to 20, even 25 for a session or two, not the whole, not just a beat and then bring the volume back down again. So you give a little volume bump and then the next two weeks, you're really sucking the fatigue out. You're dropping the volume quickly and you're rising, raising the intensity up really, really quickly. You're maintaining it as you go along into a peak day. Okay. That could be a 12 week cycle up to the start of a camp up to, I mean, I remember I, I struggle this as a collegiate football player because I would be peaked at camp. I'd be lean, I'd be strong, I'd feel good. And then you get beat down for like, you know, uh, this is back in the 100 years ago. I remember we did 22 two a day full padded practice in college. This was the year before they started making rules about <laughs> being a strength coach the next year. And I'd go, oh, I had to wear my pads today. I'm like, shut up. Right. I mean, uh, I have old school stories and, and the people before me have even old, gnarlier stories than that. But the point is, I remember going through that two a days and not being able to lift very much because you just hammered. And then you come out the other end of that and your body comp sucks. You're a little bit beat up. You know, you're tired and you try to recapture some of that, but, but you're so beat up and, and hammered by that point when the season starts, it's hard to lift like you were right. So a smart coach would say, Hey, let's, let's do our two a days, whatever. Um, sure. But, and, and you try to lift throughout as much as possible, just a little bit here and there, the coach would try to work in some stuff, but you couldn't give max effort because your hands hurt, your back hurts, right? All these different things. Cause sports practice volume is very high. And so a smart coach would say, hey, let's have a day down when we go lift. We spend a day really focused on lifting weights again to recapture some of that strength or maintenance it. Um, that would be a smart play, right? It would take a bold coach to do something like that because many times it's hard to walk away from tradition, okay? And, and keep interspersing the lifting and, and this maintenance of strength throughout. <clears throat> so when you start the season, when the things actually matter, the, your athletes are feeling really good or you're feeling really good. So just something to think about, and you could apply it to any sport. I just applied it to the college football, but many times I see the weight training volume down, come down so low during these heavy practice times that you lose your, your peak uh, and you peaked at the wrong time. 
Okay, peak for the gains that matter. Even if a bold coach would peak and um, might do some higher volume training and lifting early in the season and, and accept that there might be some losses because legs are tired. Because right now, obviously, no one's so tired they get hurt, but you might have some accumulation effects that you that you accept that there's going to be some tired legs. But when the games that count start, then your athletes are peaked where other teams have already peaked. They peaked in the preseason. Who cares? Who cares when you peak in the preseason? How many teams have you seen, like in college basketball, that ended up, you know, just they're okay, and then they went to their college uh, tournament, won the tournament, and then go to NCAA tournament and do really well, and vice versa, okay? Now, there's obviously sports skill things going on there, but there's also a lot of strength conditioning. I would say a lot. There's a strength conditioning impact there as well. All right, I think I made my point. Um, so that's the long-term view, a 12-week view. Well, block training, you can compress that. And if you've seen some of the videos, I talk about some of the things I've experienced, experimented with over the over time. So um, let's let's take it to the world of weightlifting that I'm familiar with, of recent lore. Uh, well, I won't say lore, of recent time. Um, so there'd be meat, there'd be a meat that was you know roughly three months apart. So I could do the twelve week cycle, or I could say, well, if if I have many peaks along the way, I can see how the athlete's progressing. I could peak them um, many peaks. Basically, you know, we're always testing to some degree, but I don't have to wait 12 weeks to see if the cycle worked. Or I have um, meets that are close together. So I have a meet that's six weeks apart. So I'm just giving different examples here. Well, I can make many versions of linear periodized models. So in other words, instead of doing three weeks of accumulation, right, you know, uh, a rest period, four, a rest week, a deload week, whatever, four weeks of, of uh, you know, building back up and then a little bit of rest and then a peak week up to the top. Now I'm going to do that in a compressed fashion. And these words that in block periodization came about from Dr. Cern, accumulation, transmutation, and realization. Okay. So accumulation is just that accumulating enough volume. So in, in an athlete, let's say a weightlifter though, it's coming off of meat already and they're going to have a meet in six weeks or an athlete that has a meet in six weeks. You don't want to have accumulation cycle. That's so massive. Think about the fitness fatigue model here that there's so much fatigue that's going to take uh, weeks to recover from it or, uh, you know, a full week to recover from that kind of fatigue. So you might have just one week of accumulation, especially an experienced athlete. Cause remember they're going to pick up fatigue a lot quicker because they push the stimulus a lot harder because they, they can, Okay. And an, 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 an athlete that's not as experienced, just barely starting out, you could have an accumulation cycle that's a little longer, okay, two weeks, maybe even three, all right, depending on how experienced they are. And if, if they're not showing signs of significant fatigue, they are both accumulating and realizing at the same time, right? Just because the fatigue is not an issue. Again, the fitness is coming up so fast that fatigue is not masking it. The stimulus isn't so much yet. So you might do, let's say, the six weeks, you have this athlete does accumulation cycle. You might have a half a week where there's a little bit of, like earlier in the week, it's a little bit of a down volume week, and then you start to realize those gains, okay? And so that week is a transitionary week. So there's two weeks there. And then you have three weeks of, of realization. So you're building the load. You're, 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 you're having testing weeks. You're having, right? And you can auto-regulate during this time as well. Auto-regulation and periodization are not two different ways of programming. They're part of the same idea or they're, they're part of the same thread, meaning periodization is this overarching kind of concept, and you can use auto regulation inside periodization, okay? how Again, this is the programming thing. Auto regulation is more about programming. Periodization is more about the organization of the program, okay? And so, um, again, you have these three-week buildup, okay? We're at five weeks now, and you could have a short then, a very short one-week transition into um, where you're realizing these gains. So you, you have this transmutation cycle, and then you have one week of realized gains, which is a taper, and then you do the meet. Now, you can adjust those. You can say, I want two weeks of a down. Okay, fine. I'm just giving examples of what basically block training allows you to do. It allows you to compress this, what's traditionally thought of as a long linear model, into a smaller period and adjust the block lengths in order to produce better results. Now, <clears throat> you can do this in any framework. You could do this in hypertrophy. Okay, obviously in hypertrophy, accumulation of volume is critical. Okay, accumulation volume is critical, but you still might have times where you want to work in some strength training in order to improve strength in order to move heavier loads when you accumulate more volume. Okay, you could have um, volume cycles that are the accumulation cycles that are longer now, and then have a two week realization cycle in strength that the individual's gonna get stronger and feel really good. Okay, a transmutation, I should say, transmutation and realization cycle here, um, where you're gonna see strength gains improve and right, you're realizing these gains because of the gains on muscle hypertrophy, and then you go back to hypertrophy training again, because it's all about accumulated volume. Um, you can think about then of all the different ways that, uh, like a track athlete, 
might come off of one meet and then have to turn around and do another, maybe in four weeks. So you might have one week of, of accumulation, just one week. And then trans that there's a transitory period there, maybe transmutation, right? Okay. Well, you take that week of accumulated volume and you transmute, right, into a two-week phase of, right, moving towards heavier, high intensities. The volume is coming down, the intensity is coming up, especially in the weight room, but you might see your sprint training start to come up in terms of volume. But the total volume for the week is going to be less because you can't sprint. You can only sprint so much before you get slower. So the total volume of work has to be lower. So before in the accumulation phase, the resistance training allows for higher volumes because of the nature of training. You're not going to do a lot of sprinting maybe there a little bit, stay in touch with things, maybe a little bit of a more of a sprint endurance type of thing. Then when you get to the transmutation cycle, excuse me, you're going to lower the volume of the resistance training, bring up the volume on the sprint training, but the overall total volume of work is going to be less just because there's going to be more rest in a two hour workout, for example, than there would be in, in the accumulation phase because you're sprinting more you're doing more sprint drills you can only do so many you have to have rest in between those drills completely in order to get maximum speed etc and then you have a realization phase where you really pull the volume down okay um, on both of these activities and really work on the intensity as you re um, wash out any fatigue potentially you could toy with the idea of bumping volume um, uh, it could be a one day bump so the last you know in that third week the last day of that training week you push the weight training volume up after the, to say they sprint in the morning or did some speed training where you push the weight training volume up that last day, there's going to be some fatigue, but you know, next week is the realization week and it's only one day. It's only one day of fatigue. And again, this is things you have to mess with though, because some athletes will recover from them. You know, like a female athlete will recover for something like that. In fact, you could even bump, depending on the athlete, you could have them um, incur a higher volume day Monday and sprint on Saturday, right? It's possible. Okay. If you have a bigger um, male athlete, you might have to, if you're going to do that volume bump, you might have to do it earlier in the week before the realization cycle. So these are things that you have to experiment with. But what periodization gives you, when I'm, I'm getting off track a little bit from the article, but what periodization gives you in the article, and I think the authors do a wonderful job of this, is is showing you what the structure is, how to use it, um, both in this long-term viewpoint, like over the course of 12 weeks, but also in the block model, which is taking smaller bites, Okay, and making sure the sequence is properly ordered for whatever outcome you want. I mean, you don't want to do heavy weight training, uh, you know, high volume weight training, heavy, you know, heavy resistance training in your realization phase and spending a lot of time on that. And you're a distance runner. Okay, does right? You can do some accumulated weight training, but you have to be careful of gaining hypertrophy. Yeah, right. I mean, there's some. Right? It depends on your outcome, but the sequence of blocks is important. Okay. The sequence of blocks is important. The accumulation phase has to happen. If you want to see any sort of gains, you can't just linger in realization all the time. You'll maintenance. Okay. But you have to have accumulated training volume in order to see movement. Remember volume builds, volume kills. So you have to wield the sword carefully, but you want to, you have to have an accumulation phase and how you order that after that, or, or how long that accumulation phase is important. And that's where block periodization, just periodization in general, but block periodization, and I think of block periodization, this is just my little brain, is you know a more compressed version of that long, what we call linear periodized model. Within Inside of that periodization framework, then, you can do auto-regulation. You can do um, undulating type of things. You can do, I mean, you can do flexible type of stuff, right, which is auto-regulation. But um, there's a lot of things you can do within that framework. I don't see how you get away from periodization I don't see the value in not using it unless you're dealing with untrained people. And even then, there's if you think about it, periodization is just describing an increasing workload in an ordered fashion, right? Um, or it's not a workload, excuse me, increasing intensity in an ordered fashion, managing volume in an ordered fashion, managing fatigue in an ordered fashion. Well, if you're going to get better at anything, it, there has to be an organization to it. You can't be like, well, today I'm going to squat as heavy as possible. And then tomorrow I won't, you know, I'll just squat at 50%. And then when I feel, uh, well, maybe I'll squat at 60 the next day. And then, you know, and you don't heavy back squat for like, you know, 10 days. And well, you might gain some results depending, you know, who, how, if you're a master's athlete, you will overall, but why not have a program that has incremental workloads and trying to take advantage of when your fatigue has come down from that first training session, do another one and improve your performance. So you're getting stronger from day to day, cycle to cycle. There has to be some sort of organization in that, and within that framework, then you can provide the flexibility that auto regulation might reply or uh, supply. And I've changed my philosophies over the year quite a few times. Um, I incorporate a lot more auto regulation than I used to, but I'm finding that I need to be careful with how much I use because athletes um, uh, they still need to be pushed. I like auto regulation a little bit more when I'm around because I can help them auto regulate. 
where when they're on their own, it's, it's, it, they tend to regress to, and we have research on this. Like if I say an RPE, what I think they're doing, like they, athletes tend to do the opposite <laughs> of what you think. So if I say go hard here, they'll go too little. If I say go too little here, they'll go too hard. They regress to the mean. So that's a real, I think that's, I think that's seen in the research letters. It's a problem when you do like RP methods, auto-regulatory methods. We just have to be careful with that. You have to educate athletes on how to use those methods properly. All right. That's 20 minutes in. Hopefully you hung with it. A, a great article. I highly recommend it. I wouldn't call it an article. I'd call it a manual um, on periodization. It does a great job of summar summarizing and then even um, dealing with some criticisms of periodization, providing some examples. Um, uh, talks about training residuals, which are really important when you're not when you're training multiple variables like speed, strength, endurance, right? all these things are important to you, like a college football or a college football, like a football player, American football player, a rugby player, right? That require all these skills mixed together, basketball and to some degree with you know, size, you know, et cetera. Um, you can read through this and I think you'll glean a lot out of it. I'm out. I'll see you the next one. Like this video if you liked it. Uh, be sure to subscribe to my subscribe to my channel. Um, lots of journal club reviews, book reviews, topic review or topic um, uh, videos, you name it adding all the time. Um, hit the smack the bell for notifications and I'll see you in the next one.